maker and sustainer of the universe, your Son, our Savior, Jesus, who took on the cross for each and every one of us to that other presence that's here in this room with us this morning, your Holy Spirit. We thank you for that amazing grace and that faithful, unconditional love that sustains all the beauty and joy and blessings that we experience, that gives us our heartbeats and our breaths, that gives us purpose and meaning for being here. And we thank you for all that you have done for us. And we especially thank you, Jesus, for bearing our sins, for taking on the cross, for showing us the way and giving us the example of how to not only love you, but how to love each other. We thank you for listening to us and to our prayers, and we especially thank you for listening and answering those prayers in your, in your unique and special ways. We come again, of course, this morning, not only confessing our shortcomings and our faults and our sins and standing on your grace, but also asking once again that you be with our loved ones, our family members, and our friends who we've lifted up by name here today, who are dealing with fears, who are dealing with failing health, aging, grief and loss and death, the heart of heart is so difficult for all of us to deal with in this journey of life. We ask that you be spiritually with these loved ones that we have lifted up by name here this morning, and that your miraculous abilities will continue to be at work within them, that they will know your presence, experience your grace, and also rest and stand on your amazing love. It seems like such a unique and different time as we go through this pandemic as a world. And yet, we also know that with your long history with us that covers thousands and thousands and thousands of years, that there have been other disasters, other tragedies, other pandemics, other uneasiness and unrest in this world. And through it all, through it all, you have seen your creation through. And so may we stand upon that blessed assurance that you will see us through this as well. And that we will find ways to work in this new situation. And that we will find ways to reach out a loving and Christian hand to those who are different from us that we can focus on what we have in common and not our differences and work together to pass down a better world than we inherited. We ask for your blessing to be upon your church, that it may be a witness to your way and to the way in which we can fix all the problems that are in our world, that your church can be the shining beacon on a hill to show the rest the way of how to find peace and joy, blessings and love for one another and for you. I'm sure, O oh Lord, there are many concerns that were not expressed by voice here this morning. And I ask that you address those now in, your, in accordance to your will. And that we can have obedient hearts to accept your will for our lives to give up our own sense of self-determination and to allow you to be our God and our Lord and to guide us and direct us and to follow just as Moses did your direction and your will for our lives as well as your son who took on the cross and the burden of our sins in accordance to your will 
in order to not only fulfill what you had in store for him, but also to restore us to your goodness and your perfection. It is in his name now that we lift our voices to you now, praying the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
up. God is good. And all the time. He certainly is. Thank you, Peyton and Faith and Rob and Blake. That was great music and a very inspirational. Appreciate you sharing your talents with us here today. When I was in seminary, there was a professor there. His name was Clark Williamson. Not that that's very important, but here he was a Christian educator who was married to a Jew. And uh, we all inquired about how that worked at home and whose who's, who's place of worship did you go to and, you know, how did you eat? Did you have a kosher kitchen, kitchen and all those kinds of things? And he would laugh at us all. But he had a phrase, and it was really for him more than just a phrase. It was a concept that he taught us. And it was, a, uh, the phrase was simply that the Jews were the people of the way. And by that he meant that in the Old Testament times, each one of these little tribes of humanity had their own little ways of doing things, but that the Hebrew people were the people of a particular way, of God's way. They were the ones that had the commandments memorized. They were the ones who worshipped monolithically one God and not a variety of gods. And they were also not only being the people of the way, knowing all these things of God's way, it was their mission, their duty, their obligation as Hebrews to share that way with the world that they encountered. Now we could all say that, you know, well, they had some troubles, they had, they had their failings, their shortcomings, and sometimes they messed up and didn't witness very well to that way. But God chose at a particular time to have His Son raised in that way, in that culture, to bring that way to the world, to all of us, to those of us who were raised Jewish and Hebrew, so that we too would know the blessings of this God that they called Yahweh, and that we too could learn those ways and execute those ways and then share those ways with a world that lives by another way. Another Hebrew who used to live by the old way was on his way to Damascus when he had an experience with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And it not only changed his perspective, but it changed his whole worldview to such a point that he changed his name. And it became his mission to go into those places of the known world that had never heard of Yahweh, that had never heard of Jesus Christ, and to teach them the way so that they too could be people of the way. Today I'm sharing with you what Paul thought was those ways. In his letter to the Romans, in the 12th chapter, which is towards the end of his, this letter, he has a whole list of things that describes being part of God's way and living that way for ourselves. The, the 12th chapter starts out that we are to present ourselves as bodies, as a living sacrifice to a holy and acceptable God. And not to be conformed to the world, but to transform the world to this new way. So today I'm sharing with you what Paul defined as that way. And it's very close to what Jesus defined as the way to God in the Sermon on the Mount, but it's put in different words. So I'm sharing with you Romans 12, verses 9 through 21. Let us share together the teachings of Holy Scripture. 
Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection and outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, but rather be ardent in spirit and serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but rather associate with the lowly. And do not be claimed to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought of what is noble in the sight of all. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will reap burning coals on their heads. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. May God have God's blessing to the reading of the word. We've seen this world spin around now for a long time as humans. We develop habits and patterns and lifestyles that conform to the world in which we live. Because we like to be accepted, we like to be part of the larger community, we want to fit in, we want to be hip and cool and all those kinds of things. But there's so much evil that we see in today's world. So much greed, hate, disrespect, division, secularism. And what kind of confuses me is we keep trying to do the worldly ways to fix these problems. And we keep finding ourselves in the same position economic injustice and racism and division and classification amongst peoples for whatever reasons, whatever modes of classification we want to use. And we wonder why the world seems like it's spinning out of control. I watch our political party system play the same games they played in the 60s and the 70s. The other party is always wrong, and if our party is wrong, we never admit it. I watch people who have more money than us walk a little haunty and a little better than, or I watch people that have less money than us feel like that they're not good enough to be part of us. And I wonder where these classifications come from. And then I say, oh no, that's the world in which we live. That's the ways in which we treat each other. I mean, I even got family that, that doesn't show me as much respect as they do other family members because the other family members make more money than me. They didn't decide to go into preaching. Get up. I got one laugh out of that. 
And as I said last week, I would like to see these issues fixed in my lifetime. But last week's message was the only way we're going to fix them is if we become slaves to righteousness. And not be of the ways of the world, but to be of the ways of God. And to show that righteousness. Because the other ways aren't working. I would actually say that race relations in this country was better when I was a teenager in the 70s than it is today. And my mom in Anderson High School was dealing with racial fights and racial wars and all kinds of rioting at Anderson High School in the 70s. But it was better then than it is today. Because all we've done as a nation is gone back to our old earthly human ways. And we forget about the teachings of Jesus Christ. When Jesus saw a person of another race sitting at a well, he didn't grab onto his purse. He didn't walk in the other direction. He didn't call the person lowly names. He sat down and talked to the Samaritan woman. Totally against the customs of the time. Totally. The disciples were even freaking out on him. Jesus, what are you doing talking to that Samaritan woman? What are you doing hanging around prostitutes? What are you doing eating with sinners? And yet, isn't that how we still live with each other? We forget what he showed us. Or even if we don't forget it and we know it, we don't execute it in our lives. None of these instructions are difficult for us. We understand them when I read them to you. It's not like they're beyond our ability to fulfill what is being asked of us. It's a matter of will. It's a matter of being able to execute the rules that we have been given. I mean, my dad had a simple rule. If you can't live by the rules of the house, get out of the house. Right? And when you're 12 or you're 14 and you know you can't make it on your own, what's your choice in the matter? Okay, either live by the rules or go be homeless. Hang out on the railroad tracks, right? But God doesn't make that our options. He loves us anyway. Even while we don't follow the rules. But imagine what the world could be like if we could live these teachings. If we really could let our love be genuine. If we could hate what is evil in the world and hold fast to what is the good. If we could outdo one another in love with mutual affection and outdo one another in showing honor. Imagine what Washington, D.C. could be like if they could just execute this part of these teachings. Be zealful and urgent in spirit, serving the Lord, and I would add, don't serve yourself. And one of the passages, one of the verses that I have been to think for my life is to rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, and to persevere in prayer. Life is going to give us curveballs. It's not always going to be a rose garden. That's the seasons of life. Even the animals know that the winners of the world come, and it's time to prepare for it. And so they don't sit around and complain about how horrible it all is. They stay true to hope. And they persevere in suffering. And they persevere in prayer. Imagine what America could be if we would all contribute to the needs of the saints. If everybody in America who claimed to be Christian would contribute to the needs of the saints. 
instead of the needs to themselves. Man, we could have a really strong, powerful church. And imagine what a country it could be if Christians would extend hospitality to strangers. Not just walk by them and wonder what poor decisions they've made in their past to put them in that position, but to actually extend hospitality to strangers. That doesn't mean giving them money. That means showing them respect and honor and dignity. Bless those who persecute you. He repeats it. Bless and do not curse them. One of the things I learned growing up in the Midwest is that if you do me wrong once, shame on you, but if you do me wrong twice, shame on me. But that's not Jesus' teaching. Jesus actually was dying and bleeding out on the cross and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Is that our attitude to those who hang us on our crosses? Or is it, oh, I'm going to get them and I'm going to get them good and I'm going to get them better than they got me so they'll never forget how bad they did me. That's the way our world lives. And we call ourselves Christians. And we forget what Jesus did for us. He didn't curse us. He asked for God's blessing to be upon us. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. I will tell you that one of the struggles I've had in parish ministry is when I go to a hospital room and the news from the medical professionals is very bad. Doom and gloom. Person's going to die anytime. They're surrounded by family and they're all weeping. And there's a part of me that says, I don't want to be a part of this sad, horrible scene. I want to just run and get away from it. But the call of Christ in me says, no, these folks are hurting. And I need to hurt with them. And it was a hard lesson for me to learn that there are no magical words in those situations. Sometimes the best thing for me to do is just cry with them and say nothing. Because there's nothing that you can say. And that the support of having somebody else with that family that fills that sense of loss and grief and fills those real tears is better than anything a person can say. It's not easy. But if you remember, Jesus knew what it was like to weep. Whether it was the passing of Lazarus or looking upon from a distance the city of Jerusalem and knowing what its future was going to be just a few short decades later when Rome would come in and burn it to the ground. He weep with us. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haunting but associate with the lowly. And do not claim to be wiser than you are. When Casey started youth ministry here, she once asked me, what do I do if some kid asks me a question I don't know? And my only response was to say, tell them you don't know. It's okay not to know everything. If it's beyond your area of expertise, don't claim you're an expert in it. We don't have to be the smartest people in the world. We're not remembered because of our intelligence. We're remembered because of our giving, generous, loving spirits. I mean, Billy Graham's not remembered for how smart he was. Mother Teresa's not remembered for how smart she was. They're remembered because of how they treated other human beings. And of course, nobody likes a wise person anyway, right? Do not repay anyone for evil. Two wrongs do not make a right. But take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. I'd like to do this as a minister. 
I hear somebody's bad-mouthing me behind my back. So, does that give me right to bad-mouth them behind their back? I hear somebody's mad at me. So, does that give me the right to be mad at them? No, you guys wouldn't respect me if I behaved that way. Your expectation of your minister is to do things that look noble in the sight of all. Is my standing before God any different than in any of yours? Just because I'm a minister of Jesus Christ? Well, okay. Maybe I should be a role model for Jesus. But shouldn't all of you too? Uh, don't you claim Christ as your Savior too? And don't those that you encounter in the world see what you do and say that's what Christians do? As I've made the claim before from this pulpit, I think a lot of the reason the church in America is in the trouble it's in is because of how the church has behaved towards other people and not behaved in Christian manner. Not done what is noble in the sight of all. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This gets really personal when you start talking about your neighborhood. Or like in Meredith Fry's situation when you live in a nursing home. When the neighbors are all of a sudden real close. And yeah, you can create all kinds of apprehension and drama and difficulties for your neighbors. But Jesus and Scripture tells us that if we can, live peaceably with all. And never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I kind of think of this in another way as to let people make their own beds. I don't have to make their bed for them. That the truth will come out eventually. That what goes around comes around. And I don't have to do anything. But it's not mine to execute justice in the world. That's God's. And God will execute His judgment and his justice and his righteousness in accordance to his will it'll be appropriate unlike ours which is usually unappropriate Paul says rather than seeking vengeance if your enemies are hungry feed them if your enemies are thirsty give them something to drink and by doing this, you will reap burning coals on their heads. My mom used to quote this to me all the time growing up when my friends would make me mad. I'd say, Mom, but he hurt my feelings. And my mom would say, be nice to them because by doing that, you're going to reap burning coals on their heads. But Mom! And lastly, the last line, the last verse. Are we going to let evil overcome this world? I would submit to you that we will if we participate in it. Or we can be the standard bearers for good. And we can stand for the good. And while they burn down our cities and they burn down neighborhoods and they ride and they protest and they tear our nation apart, we can stand by for what is good. I've lived long enough to know that good will prevail if good people will but stand up and stand up for the good. And that's what I've decided to do in the 21st century. I'm not going to participate in the evil of our world. I'm not going to participate in the blasting of one political party or another just because that's commonplace. I want what's good for all of us, regardless of background, race, nationality, sexual preference, 
or any other classification that the world wants to put upon us. I'm a Christian. I'm an American. And I know that good can prevail because good has prevailed. When it looked pretty evil in the world. When our Lord and Savior took his last breath and the disciples said, look, it's over. That three-year mission was done. What are we going to do now? How are we going to make it? Where do we go? What do we do? And look who provided. Look who showed them the way. Look who resurrected again. So that they would have hope and could pass down these ways to us. So that we can pass it down to each other. You know, my mother, the school teacher, said that most of this stuff starts in our homes. She would see these students at school and they would be struggling either emotionally or mentally. And it was because they weren't getting what they needed from home. The love and the support, the structure, the discipline, the reinforcement of the good ways. Instead, it would get reinforcements of bad ways. Well, it's true with all of us too. It starts at home. It starts with how we view those around us. It starts with our attitude. It starts with our spirit. And I believe God can overcome all the evil in the world because my God is bigger than the problems that I see around me. Is the problems that you see around you bigger than your God? Then yeah, there's a problem. But when you think about God's long history with us and all the things God has witnessed humanity go through, all the wars, all the pandemics, all the classifications, all the evil that we've inflicted on one another. His constant love is still here. His grace is still amazing. His faithfulness is still great. The world's still spinning in its orbit. It's not all gone to hell in the handbasket. There's a lot of good still here. But it depends on us. Which choice we're going to make. Are we going to let evil overcome us? Or will we overcome evil with the good that we do? For me, it came down to surrendering myself. It came down to saying, Ned, you got to give away your human ways. And you got to follow God's will for your life. No, it's not only it's not always an easy way. Sometimes it leads to a cross. Sometimes it leads to persecution and judgment and people looking down at you saying, "Oh, you're a minister. You shouldn't be doing that." But yet, when you can live God's will with your life, you can turn other people on to God, and they can see God's goodness. And they can see the blessings that come by doing good instead of doing evil. So I had to surrender my own will. I had to let somebody else be in charge and not worry so much about doing it my way, but worry more about doing it God's way. Sometimes that is taking a moment out of your busy day to extend a hospitality to a stranger. Sometimes that does mean eating your pride and admitting when you were wrong. Because we all are human and make mistakes. I'm asking Christians today to surrender their own wills and to give their wills to God. Just as Jesus did. Just as Paul did. Just as Peter did. Just as all those saints who went before us did. 
to quit making life about us and to make life about Him. That was the whole, the whole goal of the purpose-driven life. Remember the purpose-driven life? Gosh, that's 15 years old now. And that whole message was about, it's not about you, it's about Him. It means surrendering, brothers and sisters. That means no longer living your life for your earthly comforts and your earthly status, but to live your life for your heavenly comforts and your heavenly status. There is a person that I told this week in this room today, and I said, you've got a treasure waiting for you, young lady. It's because she does good. She helps people. She ministers in times of need to people that are dying in the nursing home. And yet I know what the good Lord has in store for her because she has treasures in heaven because of the good she does here. It's not about her life. It's about what she can do to help others. And I think what a world it could be if we just had a couple more hundred thousands of those living in America in the 21st century. Instead of the political hacks and the dissension people and the people that are trying to create riots and trouble in our world. But rather try to do good and create good. Harmony, peace, mutual love and affection. Gotta surrender ourselves. Give it to God. That's our hymn of invitation today. I surrender all.